Welcome back to this week's episode of The Emily Show. Today is a little bit of a heavier topic, which I'm sure you saw from the title, but it's also something that I feel we just need to address. I've talked about the Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry story case quickly in other content, but I thought it was time for a dedicated episode of The Emily Show about this case. And I felt that my experience as a former criminal prosecutor and as an attorney could help. I'm also frustrated. And you know, this is one of my biggest pet peeves with kind of misinformation, misreporting, and a whole lot of people who aren't lawyers trying to pretend they know what the heck they're talking about in a criminal investigation. So with that, that is our topic for today. And it, it, it's a it, this story makes me so deeply sad, not just as like a human and a woman, but as a mom, as someone who has too much personal experience with not just loss of loved ones, but also with sitting with victims' families when they have been through the unimaginable. So with that, it is a heavier episode, but I hope that it brings some answers, some clarity, and some compassion to the topic. I don't love the way that particularly missing persons and homicides get dissected. I think there is a place and a need to talk about when somebody is still at large as Brian Laundrie is as of the recording of this on October 10th, but also to really talk about what our justice system looks like and how it operates in cases like these, what missing person cases are like a little bit. And we're going to go really through the timeline and the facts in this case, as we know them at this recording, things may change. And as they do, I will update either in the notes or update in snippets in content on YouTube and make sure that that's updated in the descriptions in those videos. So you can find that info over on my YouTube channel at the Emily D Baker, if you're so inclined. And with that, caveat, a bit of a warning. We should really just, we should just get into it. This is a heavy one. Hey there. Welcome to the Emily show. I'm your host, Emily D Baker, badass lawyer and everyone's favorite legal commentator, breaking down the legal shit in the news and pop culture stories you want to talk about. I've been a licensed attorney for over 15 years. I'm a former prosecutor and I'm a big fan of the curse words. So let's break it down. Before we get all the way into this story, we do have a sponsor for today's episode, and I want to share that now. One, so we don't break up the flow, and two, normally my sponsorships, I tie into the story and kind of joke a little bit about it, but with today's topic, it's not really appropriate, but this is a product that I stand behind and really do want to share with you. So before we get all the way into the heavy, let's thank Better Brand. Even though today we're talking about a more difficult topic, finding the right pants for work that are comfortable and stylish should not be difficult. And that's why I am working with Beta Brand again this month to remind you that there are amazing work yoga pants that have pockets that will make your life easier. Not only are they comfortable, they come in a wide variety of sizes, including plus sizes. They make you feel snatched, but you still have pockets. They even come in denim. Their business dress yoga pant is one of my favorite things, and I wore them to court on the regular. I still wear them now when I have to dress up, but they are comfortable enough that I could just swap them out with my regular yoga pants look. Your girl does not wear jeans anymore. <laughs> we love a yoga pant. So from everything from machine washable yoga denim to your just tailored black trouser, Beta Brand has got you covered. I really enjoy working with this company and I love that one, pockets, and two, they really make pants to make you look and feel your best. And isn't that what's most important is how you feel. Life is too short for work clothes to make you feel like you're being attacked. It just is. So right now, all of our listeners can get 30% off their beta brand order when you go to betabrand.com slash lawnard. That's B-E-T-A 
brandcom slash Lawnard for 30% off your order for a limited time. And when you use our special URL, you're supporting The Emily Show too. And you can find that down in the description below. Find out why women are ditching typical work pants for beta brands, dress pant, yoga pants. Go to betabrand.com slash Lawnard for 30% off yours. And thank you again, Beta Brand, for partnering with The Emily Show to sponsor this episode. All right, let's get back into today's topic. Well, before we get all the way into the rest of today's Emily show, there is an update on this case. So I wanted to come in and bring the updated information before we get into the timeline, because with this in mind, listening to the timeline, you might be able to pick up things maybe that I haven't picked up yet or that others haven't. But because there was a press conference today, on what is today, October 12th, from the Wyoming coroner. I wanted to update the information we have. There's also a new statement to the media from the Laundry family attorney that had some information in it that I was not aware had been confirmed yet. So I want to make sure we confirm that before we get into the timeline in this case later on in this episode. So I will also be linking the Gabby Petito Foundation down below in both the audio notes and in the YouTube video notes because her family is and has created a foundation to help others that have missing family members navigate that to put resources behind helping find missing persons. And I think that that is uh, definitely an important cause, but there is one central foundation where if you feel moved to donate in this case, you can do that. So I wanted to make sure I shared that information while I share information about this case. So today on October 12th, the coroner came out and stated that, that the cause of death was strangulation. The manner of death we know had previously been released as homicide. I talk about manner of death later on in this episode and about the five manners of death and the different rulings. Strangulation is one of those things that's just, it's hard to hear as a cause of death. It kind of made my stomach sink. I'm just kind of gutted about it. I'm This is going to hit very hard. As I speculated in this episode and on YouTube, they would have let the Petito family know before this press conference so they would not have to find this out with the rest of the world and they could process this information privately because it is different than other causes of death and it has definitely a more aggressive and violent connotation and it just is heartbreaking. The coroner did not give a particular date of death. The coroner indicated that the death certificate in this case has not been completed yet and that when it is completed, it will have a range and that Wyoming allows for a death certificate to have a range. They also indicated that Gabby's remains had now been released to a mortuary in the area and they are making arrangements with her family. As of the recording, all of the rest of this episode, that had not been done yet and she had not been released back to her family. The coroner did say that the date of death was three to four weeks from when she was found on September 19th. So that puts the range roughly between August 22nd and August 29th. That's important because Brian Laundrie is charged with unauthorized use of a debit card from August 30th to September 1st. So it had been my speculation and wondering that they knew that Gabby Petito had passed before the date of the unauthorized uses. We also now know that the debit card used was Gabby Petito's debit card. The law nerds on Twitter pointed out that Gabby Petito's family and the attorney that was with them when they spoke to Dr. Phil had confirmed this. And the Laundry family attorney had also today on a statement released to media confirmed that the debit card used was Gabby Petito's card. And it seems now that the allegations in the indictment are that Brian Laundry used Gabby Petito's credit card after her death to withdraw funds likely to get back to Florida or go to wherever he is now because he is still at large as of the recording of this. So what other information did we get from the coroner? They talked about the fact that Gabby Petito was not pregnant. That had been asked about and speculated about. The coroner confirmed that that is not the case. The coroner also said no other information would be released and that other determinations are for law enforcement If you wanted to see my real-time thoughts on the press conference, I did do that over on Twitter at the Emily D. Baker. Typos are because I was moving fast on Twitter. So in the timeline of August 22nd to August 29th, I will talk about this as we get into the episode, but the last text messages between Gabby and her family 
were in that time frame. But on August 27th, a vacationing family in Jackson, Wyoming did see Gabby and Brian Laundrie get into a heated argument while leaving a restaurant. So that timeline really is going to get narrowed down after the 27th and the 30th. But the information has been sent out to the FBI. There will probably be additional testing, it seems, done on this to determine maybe a closer timeline for her time of death because they are still treating this and the FBI is still treating this like an investigation, an open investigation into the homicide of Gabby Petito. While the press conference was still ongoing, the Laundry family attorney did put out a text statement to various media outlets. I saw this on Brian Enton's Twitter account and the statement reads as such. Gabby Petito's death at such a young age is a tragedy. While Brian Laundrie is currently charged with the unauthorized use of a debit card belonging to Gabby, Brian is only considered a person of interest in relation to Gabby Petito's demise. Interesting choice of words. We'll t- I'll give you my thoughts in a second. I'm going to just, we're going to hold it back and give you the quote, and then I'll give you my thoughts. Don't get ahead of yourself, Emily. At this time, Brian is still missing, and when he is located, we will address the pending fraud charge against him. This indicates a lot of things. First, it said that her death at such a young age is a tragedy. She did pass, but also this has been ruled a homicide by strangulation. So uh, this is her her killing, her murder. Um, this is more than just her death. That aside, they say, while well, Brian Laundrie is currently charged with the unauthorized use of a debit card belonging to Gabby, this confirms again that the card he is charged with using is Gabby's, again, innocent until proven guilty. But we had speculated that this was Gabby's card because he had the ATM pin. The law nerds on Twitter let me know that Gabby's family also confirmed this. So now it's not alleged that it's Gabby's card. It's not speculated that it's Gabby's card. We've now had it twice confirmed that the debit card he used after Gabby's death was Gabby's card. This, from a prosecutor's perspective, does not look good. It looks as if he knew she was dead. And now that we know her cause of death is strangulation, I think a lot will come to the conclusion that he was probably the one who did that. Again, he has not been charged. He still is a person of interest. I will talk about the timing and why he might not have been charged yet later on in this episode, and we will see what law enforcement does in the days and weeks to come if and when Brian Laundrie is found. The attorney's statement also said at this time, Brian is still missing. And when he is located, we will address the pending fraud charge. When he is located, does the attorney for the laundries know or do the laundries know that Brian is still alive? Have they had communication with him? This is not a when or if he is found. This is a when he is located, not found. They use the word located is an interesting way to phrase it. Maybe it's not carefully phrased, but it's an interesting way to phrase it when he is located. So it leads me to think that at least in this attorney's mind, they believe that Brian Laundry is still alive and still out there. They say missing. Most of the rest of us say hiding, evading, not missing. Have they had contact with him? I don't know. Maybe we'll one day find out. Additionally, when the media asked the coroner about this case and the media coverage of this case, the coroner had a very interesting statement. And I actually paused the stream I was watching and went back to look at the stream because what the coroner said was very, very specific and very interesting. And this is, again, me pulling a quote from watching the live recording back more than once. The coroner said that of the death of Gabby Petito, unfortunately, this is one of many deaths around the country of people who are involved in domestic violence. He then goes on to say that other cases have not gotten as much media attention and perhaps her presence on social media is what brought so much attention. But we now know what the coroner thinks. Now, he wouldn't answer specific questions about who he thought did it. And John Walsh asked numerous times, well, twice, do you know, do you have any doubt in your mind that Brian Laundrie did this? And the coroner is like, it's not my determination to make. That is a law enforcement determination. The coroner's office is to do an autopsy of the body and come to those scientific findings and rulings. They are not an investigative branch in the kind of criminal law enforcement investigative sense. Yes, they are a part of law enforcement. Yes, the autopsies are used in trials, but they're not investigating who did the thing. They're investigating the how of the thing, if that makes sense. So it was very interesting to hear. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Did he just say that? Did he just say this is one of many deaths around the country of people who are involved in domestic violence? 
And yes, he did. So the coroner believes that this strangulation death by homicide is a domestic violence related death. That is not their official finding. It is probably the opinion of that particular coroner. I wonder if we will see more made of this statement or comment in the future, but I think that's what a lot of us are thinking and feeling in watching this. Again, Brian Laundrie has not been charged in this case. All signs point to this as probably him, particularly given the new information, but that is not known yet. Law enforcement clearly knows more than we do and will know more than we do. And hopefully we will see what they do from here and Brian Laundry will be apprehended and charged appropriately. That is my that is my hope. So I will continue breaking this down on social and we have a lot more episode to go. Thank you for being a Lawnard. Let's get into the rest of the show that was recorded prior to this press conference. So in breaking this down, I thought that going through the timeline would be the most helpful. Look, as a district attorney, yes, I sat and talked with families who had lost people due to homicide and murder. I never know what to say. I don't think there is anything right to say, and I'm sure that Gabby Petito's friends and family are experiencing that, not to mention the thousands of families across the world that are watching that, I mean, if not more, that have lost loved ones to homicide that have lost loved ones in cases like these where somebody's gone missing and then later been found. It really can be very hard to watch this 24-hour news cycle dissect cases like this for those who have been through it. And my heart goes out to all of them. But in this case, we're going to talk about Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie. They were former high school sweethearts. They were engaged. It seemed like the families knew each other. They were, you know, not just on this big van trip where they were kind of living the hashtag van life, but they were also planning a future together. And I just can't imagine that betrayal. And I will talk about that as we get more into this, because that's just from my perspective as a human, what the Petito family must be feeling about the Laundry family, who has still really remained silent and uncooperative throughout this timeline. And they were documenting their journey on Instagram and a newly created YouTube channel. And that really has brought the van life community. And I've watched these videos. I'm always fascinated, but I've lived in a 900 square foot house. I do not need to live in a van, but I am fascinated by kind of the get back to your roots, simpler life, wonderlust of it all. And I love seeing people go out on those journeys and that adventure and build their living spaces to just take it with them and be out in nature. There's something very fascinating and kind of simplistic and minimalistic and appealing about that to me. So these are videos and this is like a community that I do watch on YouTube and very much enjoy. And it is a very large community that Gabby really seemed to be trying to become a part of in this give back to the earth, simpler living community. And this community actually helped locate her when police and law enforcement actually did find her, but we will get to that in the timeline. So when people talk about social media having its ups and downs, it does. It absolutely has its good and its bad. This starts really on August 12th in the timeline with Moab, Utah police encountering Gabby and Brian in the van and pulling over their van. There had been a 911 call that they had gotten into an altercation. The 911 caller indicated that Brian Laundry had hit Gabby Petito and then police pull the van over. That footage has since been released. I think that the reason it was released later in this timeline was to not just bring light to the continued search for Gabby Petito, but also perhaps to put a little bit of pressure on the Laundry family to come forward with what they knew because this footage was released before Gabby Petito was found. This entire footage is available on the internet if you want to watch it. It is tremendously hard to watch. Anyone who's had a volatile relationship or domestic violence relationship of all the commentary I've seen has said that this is very hard to watch. Brian in the video and encounters with police is very calm and very like, well, this is this and that is that. Gabby is undone. She is upset. She's like, I'm just trying, I'm trying. And she's still taking all of the responsibility for everything going wrong on herself. It is very, very difficult to watch, but in, in the way of the world, Brian had physical markings on him. The police were trying to figure out if they were going to take Gabby Petito into custody and further investigate this. 
police decided, and again, hindsight being what it is, I'm sure that lots of law enforcement officers watch this and go, no, if there's a domestic like this with this back and forth, you just take everybody in, you do the reports, and then you sort it out because these situations can be volatile. And now we know that Gabby Petito is deceased. It seems at the hands of Brian Petito. That is the wide speculation, but we don't know that for sure yet. Her entire autopsy has not been released to the public at this time, but the footage is very difficult to watch, but it is available on the internet. So the police separate them for the night, and this came forward later after Gabby Petito is reported missing. On August 17th, Brian Laundrie flew from Salt Lake City to Tampa. So he went back to Florida. And at that time, it's reported that he took some more items and closed out a storage unit that they had had to save money because they were contemplating extending the road trip. Now, there's nothing in this entire timeline that makes me think that that was anything other than it was, or perhaps that the couple needed some space. Traveling can be difficult. This relationship did seem to be volatile based on what we've seen in reports and based on reports that come later in the timeline. Maybe that space on the 17th was needed for everyone. So Brian had returned home and then on August 23rd returned to Salt Lake City to rejoin Gabby Petito in their cross-country van life adventure. On August 24th, Gabby had been FaceTiming with her mom and said that they were leaving Utah and heading to the Teton Range in Wyoming. And those, when I talk about what Gabby's family is sharing all of these are coming from news reports from the Petito family attorney. When I talk about the things from Brian Laundry and Brian Laundry's family, those are all coming from the Laundry family attorney. In you know recent days, the Petito family has all gone on to Dr. Phil, talked about their feelings on the case. If you want to know what they are going through, I would absolutely go and watch that interview. It, it's just, it, it really is heartbreaking what this family has been through and so many families that have lost loved ones, not just to homicide, but also that have loved ones that are still missing that they just don't have answers for. I can't imagine kind of the human cost that that takes. So on the 25th, Gabby had been in contact with her mom during the day and her family through their attorney said that they believe August 25th, she was still in the Tetons. On August 27th, and the reason this matters is because on August 27th, a couple reported to police again later on in this investigation that they saw Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry involved in an altercation or a commotion when they were leaving the restaurant and that Gabby Petito was in tears, that they thought Brian Laundry seemed angry. And so that kind of gives us, you know, we know on August 27th that Gabby and Brian are in Wyoming. They're in the Teton area in Jackson, and they have another altercation that's been reported. The Petito family lawyer also says on that day that Gabby and her mom were in communication and texting. Then on August 30th, Gabby has a text with her family. This is the last time they receive a text from her. They have reported that they don't believe this text actually came from her, but it said no service in Yosemite. They don't believe she sent this text. There are lots of questions about what happened on August 30th and whether she sent this text or not. We will talk about that when we get into Brian Laundrie being indicted. When I pull up that indictment, for those of you that are on YouTube, you'll get to see it. For those of you who aren't on YouTube, if you want to go see it, you can go to the YouTubes. But when we talk about that indictment, these dates matter very much. And we'll talk about that. On September 1st, as I think we all know, Brian Laundrie returns to his parents' home in Northport, Florida without Gabby Petito, the ALPR or the license plate. There's these license plate readers on roads that will capture license plates and can later be searched. The license plate reader caught Gabby Petito's white van coming off of the 75 going towards Northport at 1026 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on September 6th. Odd look. We're going to get into all the questionable shit that is causing everyone to be like, what was happening here? But here's the thing. From a per personal perspective, if your adult child was on a extended road trip with their significant other and their fiance, and they came home without that individual, but with that individual's vehicle, wouldn't you have a whole lot of questions? Yep. And then everything that happens next, I think most of us are running through that filter going, this doesn't make sense. Agreed. 
it doesn't make sense. So between the moral of what is happening with the laundry family and the legal of you can't force people to talk to police because, you know, we have rights under the Constitution, there's this divide that we're seeing. So September 6th, the laundries go camping. Mm Mm-hmm. With Brian. And Brian's sister is there for a period of time as well. She has also been very vocal on social media, but said that her family has cut her off. You know why? Because anything her family tells her, she can turn around and tell the media. So she was told that the family attorney said not to talk to her anymore. So she's not in communication with her parents. And you can find kind of Cassie Laundrie's statements to the media and to reporters and to protesters outside her home all over social media and in news reports. We're not going to dive into that too much because we're trying to stick to the timeline and the facts. September 6th, they go camping 75 miles away from their home. Laundry's mom checked into the waterfront campsite at Fort DeSoto Campground. They were there from 9-6 to 9-8. Then on September 11th, Gabby Petito's family reports her missing to local law enforcement in Suffolk County, New York. From September 1st, when Brian Laundry returns home, the Laundries didn't tell the Petito family that he returned and Gabby didn't. It was between August 30th to September 11th when they didn't have any communication from her and she hadn't been updating on social media either that they reported her missing. That same day, Northport authorities go to the laundry home and were told by the family to talk to their lawyer. So they already had lawyered up, if you will. Most people don't anticipate law enforcement coming to their door and go, oh, here's our lawyer. They had already talked to their lawyer. That says a lot, doesn't it? They're 11 days after their son comes home alone with his fiance's van. Police finally come knocking and they say, we have a lawyer, go talk to them. It's what's causing so much animosity and suspicion around the Laundry family. Again, they are not obligated to talk to police. They are not obligated to do anything legally. Morally, most of us are looking at this going, how do you do that to another family? Like, how do you not tell them anything. How do you not communicate with them? And that's part of the frustration in this story. And I think it's also what's feeding some of the interest in this story is what do they know? People now want to know what are Brian Laundrie's parents doing? What have they done? And did they help him escape? Are they hiding him? Are they helping him hide? And will they ever be charged for that, which is all way too speculative at this point to get into until Brian Laundry is found. There really isn't much of a conversation that can be had with that unless he is indicted while he's still missing on more substantial charges. And we'll get to the charges he is indicted on when we get to that part of the timeline. On September 14th, there was an abandoned vehicle report taken that has since been on media. The different news agencies have a redacted version of the abandoned vehicle report, but it shows that Brian Laundrie's Ford Mustang was 16 miles away (laughs) from the Carlton Reserve. Now we'll get to the Carlton Reserve in a minute, but those of you that have been following this story go, oh yes, the Carlton Reserve. So September 14th, there's an abandoned vehicle report showing that Brian Laundrie's Ford Mustang is at a nature area, 16 miles away from the area his parents later tell police he was in. September 15th, reporter Brian Enton. Now, if you're not following him on Twitter, he has been on the spot on this since early September and has been covering this case very thoroughly with exclusive reports, live streams outside the house. He's been out to the reserve. He is covering this story. And he is the journalist that I go to when I'm looking for like daily updates on what's happening in this story. But he is at the laundry home on September 15th and sees the Mustang there. So when this comes out later, that there's an abandoned vehicle report and the timeline that the family gives to law enforcement doesn't match up. He was able to say, no, we were out there. And this evening, the Mustang was present. Now the parents do later say that they went to look for Brian on the 15th. They saw the Mustang. They saw a note on it from police that it must be moved. And they brought the Mustang back to their home on the 15th. But that timeline did change several times before we got to where we are now. On the 16th, the Petitos family share a letter during a police press conference. The search for Gabby Petito is still ongoing. And at this point, the laundries have been stonewalling the Petito family and not sharing any information with them. Part of that letter said, please, if you and your family have any decency left, 
please tell us where Gabby is located. Tell us if they're even looking in the right place. All we want is for Gabby to come home. Please help us make this happen. And the lawyer for the family does share that the laundry family has refused to answer questions from the Petitos, which again is a betrayal on multiple levels. But when you are frantically trying to find out what happened to your child, I can't imagine the frustration and anger that the Petito family must feel knowing that the person who last saw their daughter refuses to speak. His family refused to speak. She lived in their home. I mean, it makes all of this so strange and so tragic at the same time. On September 17th, the Laundries tell police that they just haven't seen Brian. Oopsie. Uh, he's missing too is what happened on September 17th. They say they haven't seen Brian since September 14th. They've changed that date a few times since the 13th, since the 14th. Their timelines have shifted, but we know that the vehicle report is from the 14th. They tell law enforcement that they went to Carlton Reserve, which is this massive reserve in Florida that is very swampy and has been very difficult and time-consuming to search. There are lots who believe that this was a distraction technique and that waiting a week to tell police that he was missing was also to help Brian escape. Because at this point, the Laundry family attorney says, quote, the whereabouts of Brian Laundry are currently unknown. The FBI is currently at the Laundry residence removing property to assist in locating Brian. As of now, the FBI is looking for both Gabby and Brian. And the Laundry family attorney presented this as a missing person where a lot of everyone else felt that this was now an individual on the run, but he was only a person of interest at this point. He was not a suspect to anything. Person of interest means the police really very much wanted to talk to him. He was refusing to talk. They believe they knew where he was. Now we know that they did not, and he disappeared, I think, sometime well before September 17th. On September 18th, Northport police start searching the Carlton Reserve. The FBI had continued to search in the Grand Teton National Park for Gabby. YouTubers came forward actually with footage that they had gone through and found footage of the van in the area where Gabby Petito's remains are discovered the next day. And it is widely credited that they helped the FBI kind of narrow in where to look because they went through their footage and saw Gabby Petito's white van in this dispersed camping area. And those YouTubers are from the channel Red, White, and Bethune, Bethune being their last name, B-E-T-H-U-N-E. -E. And it was them going through old footage because they had been in the Teton, Wyoming area at the same time it was reported that Gabby and Brian were in the area, which is again why even though stories like this, I'm always torn about the tear apart coverage of it, but the national coverage of this led to those vloggers going, oh, we were in that area at that time. Maybe we have footage that saw something. And they did and went and shared that with the FBI. And the next day, the FBI are able to locate human remains that were consistent with the description of Gabby. And then they started forensics to identify her. On September 20th, the FBI is back at the laundry home. They also tow the Mustang that Laundry's parents had driven back from the reserve. Well, we know it was 60 miles away from the reserve, but the parents had gone and picked up the car and driven it back. Like, if you think your kid's missing, do you take the vehicle and drive it back? Like, what? I understand that they're like, well, we don't want the police to tow it, but why don't they want the police to tow it? Hmm? Or was this the plan? This is why there are so many questions. Nothing makes sense in the behavior of the laundries in this case, and that is why there are so many questions about it. On September 21st, Teton County, Wyoming, confirms that the remains are those of Gabby Petito. The cause of death is not released and still has not been released. The manner of death is determined to be homicide, and that was released by the FBI's Denver field office. Just a quick note about this. These are two different things. The cause of death and the manner of death are separate. The cause of death is like the specific thing, a heart attack, an overdose, whatever it may be. That is the cause. The manner of death is literally the manner. It, there are five designations that coroners use, and they are natural, accidental, suicide, homicide, and undetermined. Homicide really being at the hands of someone else, suicide being obviously at one's own hand, accidental being accidental, natural being 
natural undetermined being we just don't know so the manner of death is very specific it's a designation that the coroner's office uses it doesn't mean that there will ever be a prosecution but when it's homicide it means that someone else was involved and once we know the cause of death we may know yes there is wide speculation with regard to gabby petito that the last person that saw her alive and was with her who has acted very odd in, in all of the time to come is the one probably likely responsible, but that has not been determined. He has not been indicted for that. He has not been charged with that. He has not been arrested and he is still at large. Now on September 23rd, an arrest warrant is finally issued for Brian Laundry, but it is issued based on a grand jury indictment for use of unauthorized devices. And we're going to talk about that real quick. This subsequently got updated because the arrest warrant had the wrong subsection of the U.S. code on it, but it doesn't change the indictment. So let's talk about this indictment real quick. So in this indictment that came back from the District of Wyoming, it is simply a one count saying that from on or about August 30th, remember we talked about this August 30th date, from on or about August 30th through and including on or about September 1st in the District of Wyoming and elsewhere, the defendant, Brian Christopher Laundry, knowingly and with intent to defraud, used one or more unauthorized access devices. So it is a thing to gain access. Namely, in this case, a Capital One bank debit card ending in 8774, a personal identifying number for a Capital One bank account. And then they give the two bank account numbers. And by such obtained things of value aggregating to $1,000 or more during that period, which affected interstate commerce, which is the clause for jurisdiction. Here's what all that means. Brian Laundry had a Capital One debit card that he knew the PIN code to that he was not entitled to use, and he used it to withdraw more than $1,000 worth of money. It seems to me that this was probably Gabby Petito's debit card. He accessed her bank accounts and used that money to pay in cash on the way home because what you can't do is go ahead and use credit cards when you are traveling state to state because it will be very easy to find what you had been doing. Yes, this is a federal charge. Yes, this is a holding charge. This means he can be arrested and they can continue the homicide investigation. Here's the thing. With this particular count, I don't know how to... Th this. We're going to just get through it. It's going to sound wrong. But with this particular count, you don't need Gabby Petito to testify, which we now know is not going to happen because she has been killed. The bank is the victim here. So the bank will say this Capital One bank account did not have this individual's name on it. They're not allowed to use it. The bank is the one that can testify to what happened at the ATM, the accounts being accessed. So this becomes a very easy charge to prove to a grand jury and a very easy charge to pursue an arrest warrant on for the feds. Now, yes, the FBI still, somebody, somebody messed up the arrest warrant and put the wrong subsection and subsequently fixed it. But this is an easy charge with bank representatives that come and testify to this. And if there is a future charge, if there are more charges with regard to Gabby Petito's murder, then we will see this brought into that. But it looks like they believe from this that on August 30th, Gabby Petito was not able to consent to using the PIN number for her bank account and having Brian Laundry use her bank account. And remember, we talked about August 30th being that strange text that said no service in Yosemite, which leads me to believe that that is probably the day that she was killed, though it could it have been the 29th. Yes, it could have. But right in that time period, because the indictment is very clear that it was August 30th to September 1st, that's a long way to get from Wyoming to Florida. But those are the dates that they've given us. So that is why I think that she was probably deceased on August 30th. This is what's going to make the text message to the family so interesting if there is a prosecution down the road if Brian Laundry is found. So that takes us through September 23rd. The investigation or the search for Brian Laundry has continued. The investigation has continued on October 7th for the first time. Brian Laundry's father joined law enforcement at the reserve to continue their search. I think that this was not so much to continue the search as to get Christopher Laundry out of his home and to actually have a conversation with him and maybe start to loosen him up to law enforcement so maybe they can get some information to either find Brian or about what has happened. We've already seen the Laundries change dates on things, not recollect things. So having them interact with law enforcement could lead law enforcement to 
future discoveries. I do not understand for a second why they're continuing to search this reserve. We now know that Dog the Bounty Hunter is involved in looking for Brian Laundry. Look, if he is still alive, I do not believe he is savvy enough to be on the run for long. Yes, this has been uh, less than a month. So do I think they will find him? I'm optimistic that they will. Do I think they will find him alive? I get asked that a lot. I don't know. I also got asked a lot why they didn't charge him with like Grand Theft Auto over Gabby Petito's van and taking the van. There wasn't a report that the van was stolen and we know or can assume why that is the case. So the holding charge on the financial documents is the easiest thing to prove to a grand jury quickly and show, look, the bank representative comes in and says, this person is not authorized to access this bank account with this debit card and PIN number, and they did. The bank is the one who grants you the right to use a credit card and the right to use a debit card. So the bank is really the one who needs to testify as the quote unquote victim in that circumstance or the one who has knowledge of the unauthorized use. And that's why I don't believe they pursued the theft of the vehicle. Of course, if there is a future prosecution, taking of the vehicle will be hotly discussed. We know the FBI has taken and searched her vehicle. The use of the debit cards will be used. They will try to find footage from any gas stations that he might have used. I mean, the route can't be that diverse. There's probably no, how many different tracks can you take? Probably two or three between Wyoming and Florida to get there in the amount of time that he got there in because you have that license plate reader pinging on September 1st at 1026 in the morning. So you know that he's taking money on August 30th. He's getting to Florida on September 1st, and they would know what location he accessed an ATM and be able to kind of figure out which way he might have gone and start looking for footage from gas stations. So if he is found, I think we could see more charges. And unless there's something large, I am not going to cover every small thing. I do talk about this case on occasion on social media. If again, like the indictment, if something large happens, if Brian Laundry is found, we will touch base back on it. But hopefully that gives you kind of where we are with the facts. There's no need for the feds really at this point to rush a criminal investigation with regard to Gabby Petito's killing because I can surmise that their main suspect is Brian Laundry, and he is still at large and they have the tools necessary to arrest him without triggering any timing considerations, without starting the clock to go to trial, without having an arrest warrant out. I can absolutely understand why they don't want to start that clock ticking when there is no reason to. They can really be working on this investigation without having to worry about any of those implications because the criminal justice side has a lot of timing restrictions with regards to the defendant's right and the defendant's right to speedy trial. So while he's outstanding on this warrant, it makes sense to me that they're not going to bring charges on anything else until he is found. And then I imagine that will happen very quickly. So that is where we are. That is what we know as of today. Thank you for being a law nerd. Thank you for valuing facts, not fuckery. And thank you for talking and listening to how the law works in this case and the things that I have questions about that I'm sure you have questions about. The thing I haven't liked in this case is seeing the harassment of Brian Laundrie's sister at her home over this. I mean, his sister didn't do anything that we know of. His sister is like, look, my kids have lost their future aunt who we loved. My family's not talking to me. I don't know what's going on with my brother. And then there are people outside my home screaming things when my children are home. I don't love that there are people outside protesting at Brian Laundrie's parents' home. Yes, I think their behavior sucks too. Yes, I think it's shady too. Yes, I have a lot of questions too, but none of us are entitled to those answers. None of us can make them speak. The people who are entitled to the Laundrie's answers are the Petitos. They are the ones who the Laundrie's owe that to, not the rest of us, even though we're curious, even though we're outraged. But the protesting outside their house is just... It just doesn't sit right with me at all because it's not going to change things. They are not going to all of a sudden go, yeah, you're right. All these people screaming at my house, I should say something. It's probably going to allow them mentally to hunker down even more and say it's us versus them versus letting whatever internal guilt they may have determine that they should talk to police because now they have someone to fight against and they're fighting against the people outside of their home. And that kind of gives them a mental relief because that's the focus, not 
figuring out how they are going to live the rest of their lives with whatever they know. And we don't know what they know. But the behavior with the car and the behavior with going camping are the things that are very, very off to me that lead me to believe they know a whole lot more than they have said to anyone. They lawyered up immediately for a reason, and it's very suspicious to me. I trust that that will come out. Look, whatever Brian told them, they eventually may have to share or not, but it's not protected information in any way. Could they be charged down the road if they helped him hide? Yes. Could they be charged down the road if they knew what he did after the fact and helped him evade law enforcement after there was a warrant? Yes. We don't know any of that yet because we don't know what happens next. So until really until Brian Laundrie is caught or there is another indictment, it's hard to say what might happen to his parents for any role they may or may not have had in him going oddly missing as law enforcement was closing in, it seems. So thank you again for being a law nerd. This is a hard one. This stuff is challenging, but necessary, I think. Let me know your thoughts on this episode, either in the comments of the YouTube or on my social medias where I share this on Twitter and Instagram at the Emily D. Baker or over in our Patreon. I'll be asking about this too. And that's lawnerdsunite.com if you'd like to come hang out over there. So until next time, may your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May your family be well. And may the odds be ever in your favor. Thanks for being a law nerd. I'll see you in the next one. Connect with me everywhere. I'm at the Emily D Baker. If you guys want to join the text, just text emily.com. If you want to join the channel, lawnerdsunite.com. Happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube.